Welcome to the MOOC's course Mechanical Unit Operations. The title of this lecture is Particle Size. So, what we have been discussing till now is uh, about the relevance of uh, particulate flows, especially in chemical engineering, and then what kind of uh, mechanical unit operations in general we uh, have in chemical engineering. Uh, in those mechanical unit operations, are they really these uh, particulate flows are uh, useful or not? Those some examples, some kind of classification, etc., that we have seen in the previous lecture. So, we before going into the details of uh, this particle size, we have a small recapitulation of what we have uh, uh, seen primarily with reference to the particulate flows in previous lecture that we see first initially for uh, first two three slides. So, what we have seen that main distinctive properties of solid state. So, that is when we have a kind of bulk large pieces of uh, solids. So, whatever the properties of those solids, if you compare uh, with their smaller sizes, let us say those bulk size of particles you take and then you measure their uh, physical properties like something like you know size, shape, density, hardness, tenacity, etc. those things you measure. Then what you do? You crush them. You crush them into small, small fractions and then again for those particulate material that is small, smaller size particle whatever is there, crushed material is there, that material, that solid material, for that material again you measure the same properties like you know size, shape, density, hardness, tenacity, etc. Then what you will find in general, the these properties are very much uh, different from their bulk properties uh, when you measured in a kind of larger, bigger size kind of things. So that is in general happens in this kind of particulate flows. So those, what are those properties which are in general different in particulate uh, state as well as in a bulk uh, state that we have seen. So once again we recapitulate them. So, these are in general properties of solids in large pieces differ from properties of particulate solids and then important properties of pieces of solids include generally density. Density, we define it as mass per unit volume. If the material is made up of a homogeneous or the solid is a kind of homogeneous solids, then the density of the bulk material as well as the particulate material obtained by crushing that bulk material will have the same density or both the densities would be same if the material is a kind of homogeneous. Right? Or otherwise, like, let us say if you take some kind of uh, metal bearing ores in general you get uh, from the natural resources, you measure the pro their properties, their density and then what you do after that you crush them into the small, small pieces and then you measure the density of those uh, particulate uh, metal bearing ores, then you find a different uh, density because the uh, metal bearing ores, it is not a kind of a homogeneous solid, it, uh, they will be having a different kind of a composite uh, nature. So, that is particles obtained by breaking up a composite solid may have various densities different from that of bulk material because of this uh, different materials involved in a kind of bulk material. Examples as, as I mentioned metal, bearing ores, etc. Likewise, we have a properties like hardness which represent the resistance of solids to be scratch that is different for the bulk material and then it is uh, compared to the uh, whatever the uh, so called uh, particulate solids are there that is crushed material there. Similarly, fragility which represents how easily a substance may be crumbled or broken by impact. So, let us say what we can say in general gypsum is a soft but not fragile material whereas the coal is both soft and fragile in general. Likewise, tenacity which is resistance to collisions is also different uh, for particulate solids and, uh, and their bulk material as well they cannot be same in general. So, we have also seen the role of molecular structure of solids in general. So, we have seen that some materials like you know mica, graphite, etc. when you break them you always you know you get a kind of plate like a platelet like uh, material like um, sometimes you, uh, you crush the uh, crush magnetite kind of ore material mostly you get uh, round uh, uh, ground shape kind of uh, you know rounded particle shape uh, particle shapes you get. Why that happens? Because inner molecular structure of the solids is different from one material to the other material and then that is playing a kind of a role in the uh, crust and the particulate solids material that we are getting. After crushing whatever the particulate material that we get, its shape in general depends on the inner molecular structure of the uh, solid that we have. Right? So, 
molecular structure of solids also determines some other features such as shape of the particles as I mentioned. Pieces of solids fracture following exfoliation planes determined by its inner molecular arrangement. For example, galena PBS often breaks into almost like cubical shapes. Graphite, mica, etc. in general when you crush them you get a platelet irregular shape particles in generally. Similarly, magnetite approximate rounded grains you will get when you break these uh, magnetite materials. Because of the inner molecular structure of these materials, when we break them we get different shapes of these particles. Likewise, you know what happens? The friction that is the resistance that a material offers to slide onto the, onto the other material that also depends. In general what happens let us say when you are pouring this wheat you can comfortably pour them because the wheat is offering less resistance friction for the flowing onto the other or sliding onto other wheat grains etc. So that is the reason there the friction is less so that is the reason they can comfortably flow out of a kind of container when you try to flow them out. Right? But when you take like a crushed mica etc, uh, crushed graphite material, when you try to flow out of a container, they flow very much uh, difficultly. The flow may not be so much comfortable in general, they flow with a kind of a certain difficulty level. That is because of the different uh, um, internal structure. Internal structure is like a plate-like structure. So when this plate-like material something like this are there, you know, uh, some uh, these things when they are flowing out, so often what you get? you find out that you know these are offering more resistance kind of thing or more friction they are offering. Whereas if you have a kind of grains like you know wheat grains or something like this so then they can easily flow out. So that is because their uh, inner molecular structure is such a way that they offer res less resistance while they are uh, sliding onto the other particles. Right? So this friction whatever the friction that is the resistant that a material offers to slide onto the another material is also depends on the molecular structure. Then we were discussing about the particle characteristics having seen that the distinctive properties of the solid state material especially uh, in bulk state as well as in the particulate state uh, that is after crushing them into the smaller size particles. So whatever the particulate uh, state is there and then what is the bulk state that is bigger larger pieces are there. So we have seen that the their physical properties are very much different in general especially when the solids are not homogeneous. If they are homogeneous then sometimes they may be having a kind of similar properties but the solids in general that natural resources that we get ores etc they are not homogeneous so then their bulk properties are very much different from the particulate uh, their, their particulate state when they crushed their particular properties in the, the particulate state are very much different. Uh, because in general in what happens in real life applications whether we are are we treating these solids in a given unit operation or a given unit process or taking from unit one uh, unit to the other unit for a unit operation or for a unit process whatever may be the process we in general take them in a kind of smaller sizes we do not take them in a kind of bulk size bigger size even if we are take, doing a small catalytic reaction or a combustion of a particle coal particle whatever we take we do in a kind of smaller size particle so we break them. So when we break them particle that becomes very much comfortable to transport also in general though it is very difficult compared to the fluid phase liquid or gases but compared to the bulk solid phase this particulate uh, material can be easily transported or conveyed from operations to the other operations. So the importance the, that I want to emphasize that in general whether unit operation or unit process or the connecting conveying uh, lines etc the particulate materials are the solid material that we in general take in a kind of particulate form that is in a small crust form. So that is the reason what we have whatever the particle characteristics are there we need to have a kind of clear look because these properties we are going to use in general for the characterization or controlling of any of these uh, unit operations or unit processes where these solid state materials are involved. Right? So that is the reason particle characteristics are very much important. Uh, we cannot rely or we cannot take the bulk material properties as it is for the uh, characterization or controlling of this uh, unit operations where these particulate materials are involved. Right? So that is the reason now we are going to list out what are the particle characteristics. Right? 
and then out of which how many of them were very much important and then how to deal that. That is what we start with. Several particle characteristics are very much important with respect to the product properties in general, but sometimes with respect to the uh, inlet feed material also, several particle characteristics are very much important. What are these characteristics in general? The very much uh, important one is the size, size of the particle. Because let us say when you have a kind of big uh, bulk material, uh, bulk solid, when you break them, you grade them in the small, small particles like this small small particles like these are irregular particles and then different shape particles all these things you get right. So now no two particles will have the same size in general there may be uh, exception but in general we have uh, when you crush this material we get millions of particles so then uh, each and every particle will have a kind of different size and shape in general. So the size is the very much important one then is the shape also the shape that whatever we have that also now one particle may be of this, uh, this particular shape given here. Now you can see the other particles are you know other shapes in general. The, so the shape is also going to be very much important. Most important thing that we have to see that when we crush the bulk material into the small small particles uh, size then what happens the size is not uniform first of all and then we will not get the particles of uh, similar shape or uh, same shape particles will never get. Even if the irregular shape particles we get, those irregular particles will not have the same irregularity. The degree of irregularity would be different from particle to the particle. So that is the reason size and shape are going to be very much essential, right? Why are they going to be very much essential in general? Because in the transport characteristics or in the reactions where if you want where the solid material is involved or particulate material is involved, if you wanted to report the performance of a given reaction or the performance of a unit process or a performance of a unit operations or the performance of heat and mass transfer or the uh, moment and transfer or the degree of reaction associated with these particles that all you are going to represent with reference to the size of the particle. Right? And then unfortunately we do not have one single size so then there are many wide uh, varieties of different size of particles are there so then we have to have a kind of pro proper analysis about the size. And then in general shape is also not a similar for uh, one particle to the other particle. We may have a wide varieties of shapes of particles even irregular particles we have different degrees of irregularity. That is the reason we need to have some kind of characteristic representation of size as well as the shape that is going to be very much useful in representing any of the uh, performance of the transport uh, uh, phenomena of this particulate material like uh, transport phenomena in the sense momentum transfer when they are uh, transporting from one uh, location to the other location along with the fluid or something like that or the, if there may be some kind of heat and mass transfer involved or there may be some kind of reaction is also involved. So whatever is the case so there we are going to use this kind of characteristic size and shape of the particle in general. Right, so that is the reason these two things are very much essential. Then density is also very much important because we have seen if the bulk material is, is not homogeneous then we are not going to have a kind of density um, particulate material of the same density, right? If the material is composite material then the density uh, of the material, the crushed material or particulate solids that we are going to have a different densities compared to the bulk densities. Remember we are just classifying the bulk material and then uh, particulate state or particulate solids that we are calling the crushed one. After crushing whatever the material that solid material is there that we are calling as a, as a kind of particulate solid, right? So for all these characteristics we are going to see for the particulate solids because we are going to use them in processes, unit processes or unit operations in the crushed form, right? So these are the three major important properties that one should be very much careful because density is also going to play a role because then in the let us say if there is a momentum and then heat transfer is occurring in a packed and fluid as bed. So the density of the bed material is very much important, very much essential, right? So if you change the density of the material then um, rather taking density of particulate solid, if you take the density of bulk solid then you may be ending up uh, finding out different performance of the fluidized bed theoretically.
right? So, or the results that you are going to get theoretically may not be matching with the experimental values. So, that is the reason density is also kind of very much crucial uh, parameter. So, uh, so these are the one of uh, couple of examples like you know packed and fluidized bed, but any process where the solid particulates are involved. So, there in those processes uh, whether unit operation or unit processes uh, whatever the transport is occurring, whatever the reaction is occurring these three properties whatever the size, shape and density are going to play a very a vital role. So, then we should be discussing in detail about these things in this and then coming lecture. In addition to these uh, three properties there are other properties are also there like you know sometimes surface characteristics also become important depending on the applications sometimes whether the particles smooth or hard that may also show a kind of impact on the performance of this particulate transport uh, processes. Similarly, whether the material is particle is a porous or non-porous that is also going to have a kind of impact. Likewise, hardness is also a kind of uh, important material. Sometimes you know you need a particle for a processing without undergoing any physical change. But if that material is not having that tough strength then while the process that may break down and then the physical change may occur. So, that again you know uh, cause a kind of a different a priori information compared to the uh, uh, reliable uh, experimental results. You may know whatever the a priori information that you get that may not be reliable with the experimental uh, results if the material is breaking and then something like that while the process is taking place. Because all your characteristics you are taking with respect to some kind of one particular size. Okay. Then adsorption, adsorption characteristics of these materials especially some kind of fluids are involved along with this particulate uh, phases then adsorption may also take place. So, likewise if you keep on listing there may be several properties which may be important uh, with respect to given operation or application, but in general the size, shape and density are the three important uh, properties that one must be careful about them. So, as I mentioned why particle size is most essential or important because most of the characterization and control of particulate flows in general are connected to size. Let us say uh, in a uh, packed bed, in a packed bed uh, what you have you have a kind of packed bed where you let us say uh, pack this uh, column with certain kind of uh, packing material right. So, now some fluid is coming in some kind of process heat and mass transfer probably taking place. Let us take only heat transfer is taking place and then that uh, fluid stream is coming out. Let us say here the temperature is T i outlet temperature is T o and then these particulate whatever the particles are there because uh, they are at the different temperature. So, then while this fluid is coming through this uh, bed so some kind of uh, uh, this heat transfer is taking place. So, whatever the rate of heat transfer that you are going to report in general you know that you are going to report based on the size of this particle. Whatever the packing material that you have used that size of that particle uh, material uh, that you are going to use in representing that rate of heat transfer for this example for let us say. Likewise uh, any fluid catalytic cracking reaction is there in let us say petroleum industries. What happens where the catalytic particles are there and then the crude uh, petroleum uh, uh, is given inside the FCC unit then uh, some kind of uh, reaction goes in and then you take the different fractions of products as uh, kerosene as one fraction and then uh, benzene, toluene, other kind of things are other fractions and all these kind of things are happening in general. But the performance, the output results that you are going to report in general you report based on the size of the catalyst of that particle, right. So, that is the reason size is a kind of very much important. These are the only two examples, but any operation where these particulate solids are involved as I mentioned you know you report their performance based on the size of these particles. So, that is the reason particle size is very much essential. Then size, which size should be taken? That is a big question in general when you handle particulate solids because when you take a big uh, bulk material bulk solids you have to crush them into the smaller sizes before taking them to the required unit operation or unit process unit, right? That those kind of thing you have to do crushing size reduction in general you do it. Let us say after size reduction 
you have a particles of this kind of uh, size and uh, arbitrary shapes, but let us say one of the particle is having this particular shape, irregular shape drawn here like here. So, which size of the particle should you take? So, we have a different dimension, this is the maximum dimension, right? So, should we take this maximum dimension as the size of the particle or this is the kind of a minimum dimension of the or minimum linear dimension of the particle. This is the maximum linear dimension of the particle, this is the minimum linear dimension of the particle. Which one should you take? Or you bisect this material into two halves, so then whatever the bisecting line is there, so should you take this dimension? Which one should you take? That is, that is the big question, that is the very much important and big question one has to answer. And then in general you do not have a single particle. You, you are handling millions of particles in general in this particulate flows, right? Wherever the uh, unit operations, unit pro um, processes they are involved, you handle them in millions, right? So, and then each of these particles would ha will have a different size, different shape. So, how to represent? What, what, what size of the particle should you take? So, coming to the uh, number of particles when you take the entire material, crust material, so you make a kind of fractions and then you say this particular fraction is having average diameter of this much, another fraction is having the average diameter of this much, like that we can do. That we are going to do in a subsequent lecture on screen analysis, uh, size reduction, then we are doing the kind of screen analysis, there we can uh, see. But here what we do with respect to single particle, how we can represent, how we can make a kind of a simpler characteristic representation of the particle size. How can we do that one? Th that is what we are going to see now here. So, having seen the arbitrariness in the dimensions of a single particle, so then you can understand the complexities when millions of such particles are there and then different uh, degrees of irregularities uh, from one particle to other particle, different shapes of particles from one particle to other particle. It very much becomes essential to represent a kind of a closely related, whichever is the best fit one that you have to take. There may be, now what you can do, you can do a kind of different ways of representing equivalent diameter of this particle, let us say. And the volume of this uh, particle is, let us say, 1 mm cube. Now you represent equivalent uh, sphere diameter, that is the diameter of sphere of equal volume, uh, of volume equal to the volume of the particles. So, if this is the volume of the particle, you take a particle, a spherical particle whose volume is equal to pi d cube. So, whose volume is equal to 1 mm cube. Now, what you do? This is the particle, its volume you measure, let us say roughly 1 mm cube. Now, what you do? You uh, wanted to represent in a kind of a equivalent diameter. So, let us say you take a, a spherical particle of volume equal to the volume of this irregular particle. So, that 1 mm cube, if you equate to pi d cube by 6, so this is the volume of a spherical particle whose volume is same as the volume of this irregular particles. So, from here you get dp cube is equals to uh, 6 by pi or dp is equals to cube root of 6 by pi. So, now the diameter of sphere of equal volume or equivalent diameter of this particle on the basis of the equal volume of sphere, then you can say this particle is having equivalent diameter dp is equal to 6 by pi power 1 by 3. So, this one representation you can do. Likewise, there are n number of representations are there. We have to see each and every representation and then we have to select which is best representation for a given application. And then not any kind of representation is going to be uniformly valid for all kind of application. It depends from one application to the other applications. Let us say if you have a kind of packed and fluidized bed, then uh, volume to surface uh, ratio whatever is there, that equivalent diameter if you take that is more reliable. Right? If you take uh, kind of you know cyclone separators or conveying of uh, uh, particle laden uh, gases etc., in such cases. Stokes equivalent diameters are uh, going to be 
uh, very much reliable. So those uh, equal in diameters, etc., we are going to see in the subsequent slides anyway. So the point here is that you know size, how to represent size, especially for irregular particles. So that is we are going to see here. But before going into this one, this the term, the size of a powder or particulate material itself is very relative because I said you know when you make the fractions of the material, so one fraction may be having one size, average size, another fraction may be, may be having the another size like that, different fractions of the particulate solids may, of one single particulate uh, uh, solids you can have a different sizes. Right? So that is, it is not possible to have a, a kind of exact representation or the exact representation of the powder or particulate material because a different size as well as the different irregular shapes of the particles. So because of that reason, we cannot have a one single value of size for a given powder or particulate material. It is in general a kind of relative or you can say the average size is this so and so mm plus or minus this min, whatever the uh, acceptable uh, you know uh, uh, deviations from that one. Those kind of relative things only we give. And then size is often as I mentioned used to classify, categorize or characterize the powder whether the uh, powder is a cohesive or non-cohesive. In general if the particle size uh, of that particulate solid is very much smaller order of 10 power minus 3 microns etc or 10 power minus 4 microns such small particles they are very cohesive in nature. So that way also particle size in general used to uh, classify or categorize the powder, right? But the powder, the terminology powder itself is not properly defined. How do you define whether a given particulate material is a powder or not? There are several definitions are there. But the most oftenly used definition is that or mostly acceptable definition is that uh, for a particulate material to be considered as a powder, its approximate median size should be less than 1 mm. Median size in the sense 50 percent of the material more than that size and then 50 percent of the material should be less than of that size. If the approximate median size is less than 1 mm, then we can say that particular particulate uh, material is as a kind of powder. So this is one of the definition that is uh, acceptable uh, amongst the uh, researchers uh, working in this particulate uh, area. Now powder or particulate material in general is also characterized as fine powders, medium powders and then coarse powders. These, these are a kind of relative characterization. In general coarse particles we measure in, uh, in uh, centimeters or uh, millimeters and then fine particles in general measure in, in terms of screen size that we are going to see in subsequent lectures anyway, screen analysis uh, lecture that we are going to discuss later on in detail. And then if the particles are very fine in general we report them as in terms of you know uh, micrometers or nanometers something like that. Now size of typical powder products, what we do? We take a few examples, rather examples, we take a few products which are in the powder form and then what is, what is their uh, general, in general size of those uh, powder products? That is what we are going to see here. What we have, uh, let us say, uh, pelleted products like crystalline, industrial chemicals, etc., they in general have the order of 10 power 5 microns. Whereas the granular fertilizers, herbicides, fungicides in general they have order of 10 power 4 micron size. Whereas the granulated sugars, spray dried products in general have the order of 10 power 3 microns. On the other hand, detergents may be having the order of 10 power 4 to 10 power uh, 3 microns in general. Likewise, powdered chemicals, powdered sugar, flour, etc. have the order of 10 power 2 micron size in general. This is the average typical size of the uh, material. It, it is not of the one single particle. So likewise other, other uh, products, uh, powder products like toners, powder metals, ceramics, etc. have the size 10 power 1 microns. Electronic materials, photographic emulsions, magnetic and other pigments in general have the 10 power 0 micron, order of 10 power 0 microns. Organic pigments in general have the order of 10 power minus 1 uh, micron size 
whereas the metal catalysts, carbon blacks, etc., have the order of 10 power minus 2 uh, microns. On the other hand, fumed silica in general have the order in between 10 power minus 1 to 10 power minus 2 microns. So, these are the some of the powder products in general we see in industry as well as the uh, regular uh, use. So, their respective sizes are given here just for a kind of knowledge uh, to have information about the size of these powders. So, then characteristic particle size, we should have a kind of characteristic particle size because it is going to be very much essential uh, we, as we are going to use the characteristic size for analysis of any powder or particulate matter. So, wherever we are going to have the analysis, control or characterization of the particulate flows, there we are going to use this characteristic particle size because of that reason one must be very careful in defining this char characteristic particle size because it is very much essential and important in uh, designing any kind of a particulate flow operators. In general, it is assumed that the powder particles have a kind of spherical shape, but in general that is not true. Rarely powder particles will have a spherical shapes, whereas most of the industrial powders which, uh, which are of uh, mineral ores, mineral uh, origin, they may be metallic or, or non-metallic. What we do? We derive from hard material by some kind of size reduction processes like crushing, grinding, etc. So, when you do this uh, crushing, grinding, etc. of these uh, minerals, you get a uh, small, small particles which are in general have a kind of shapes of polyhedrons of different phases, 4 to 7 phases uh, in general they have, right. So, in, in these polyhedrons may have 4 to 7 phases with sharp edges and corners, etc. So, it is not possible to have a kind of spherical shape always. Indeed, spherical shape you will get rarely upon crushing a mineral uh, crude uh, raw material. Also, in general, particles may be compact with length, breadth and thickness nearly equal, but sometimes they may also be like platelet-like uh, platelet or uh, needle-like, platelet-like or needle-like particles also we get. Sometimes what happens, particles get smaller and by the influence of the attrition due to handling, while handling or taking from one container to the other containers, what happens, the sharp edges, whatever the uh, sharp edges, corners, etc. are there. In general, let us say in transportation you have a something like platelet uh, materials or needle like materials, something like this are there. So, when they are transporting, you know what happens, these edges, edges may become smoother, they become smoother and then particles may be uh, under such conditions, you know, we, one can say that they are having a kind of spherical shape. But these things are occurring while in general handling them or while in the process of the transport that may be taking place, right, because of the smoothing, etc., that occurring because of the attrition while transporting. So, now representing size of irregular uh, particles, as I mentioned, it is very much important. As I given one example, equivalent sphere volume diameter or the diameter of a sphere of equal volume, that is what I have seen, like that there are you know different properties, not only volume, you can measure the surface of uh, particle and then what is the diameter of the particle which is having the equal surface as the particle. Like that one you can do. Another one is the volume, uh, surface to volume ratio. You can measure the surface to the volume ratio, uh, ratio of the particle and then what is the uh, size of a spherical particle whose surface to volume ratio is same as the kind of uh, uh, irregular particle. From there you can find out the uh, characteristics or equivalent diameter like that. So, like that there are several properties you can compare and then take the equivalent diameter, right. Why we take spherical? Because spherical is easy to handle and in uh, analysis also it becomes very easy to uh, do a kind of calculations, etc. So, that is the reason we take a kind of a spherical shape of the particle or equivalent sphere diameters in general we take. So, equivalent sphere diameter also there are different properties, several properties are there that you can compare. For example, let us say equivalent property of a sphere. So, that is volume diameter that we call volume diameter or equivalent volume diameter of sphere where we compare the volume. As I mentioned, let us say one irregular particles of this shape is there. If its 
size is uh, let us say 1 mm cube, you find out a spherical particle of volume which is same as the volume of this irregular particle. So, from there whatever the dp is there that is you know we call it as a diameter of sphere of equal volume dp. Likewise, we can have a diameter of sphere of equal surface also. Let us say you uh, find out the uh, you know surface of this particle as uh, 1 mm square, then you take pi d square is equals to whatever 1 mm square, then you can from pi dp square. So, then from here whatever the dp you get, so that is going to be the diameter of sphere of equal surface. So, that is this one. So, you can compare any equivalent property of a sphere like that. You can compare volume, you can compare the surface of the particle, you can compare the surface to volume ratio like that different possibilities are there. right? If you compare you know uh, sphere to uh, surface to volume this thing then pi d square pi dp square by pi dp cube by 6 is equals to whatever the let us say surface to volume 1 mm inverse is there. So, then from here whatever the 6 by dp is 1. So, from here dp whatever is that you get that may be taken as a kind of a surface volume ratio. right? So, likewise you can have a surface volume ratio also. So, basically in this equivalent representation, equivalent sphere diameters what are we doing? We are measuring either the volume or the surface or the surface to volume ratio etcetera of a particle and then equating to a spherical particle whose volume is equal to the particle volume or whose surface is equals to the particle surface like that we are doing in general. Okay? So, equivalent sphere diameters, the diameter of a sphere which would have same property of the particle itself like you know same volume, same settling velocity etcetera. We are going to take a few examples also how to calculate equivalent sphere diameter uh, when we take the volume as a kind of property. right? So, this is how we can do. So, other way is that surface volume diameter where we, we compare the surface volume ratio or the surface volume ratio of the particle you measure and then you find out a spherical particle of size certain size whose surface to volume ratio is same as the uh, irregular particle surface volume ratio. Likewise drag diameter, in a flowing stream you insert this particle and then that particle may be offering some uh, drag uh, resistance force to the flow. So, whatever the drag force is there that you measure and then at the same velocity you now insert spherical particles and then you measure the drag force. So, different particles you have to insert and then see uh, which spherical particle is offering same drag force as a irregular particles. So, corresponding size of that spherical particle should be taken as the equivalent drag diameter like that one has to do. Then free falling diameter is the uh, one. So, free falling speed in the same liquid at the same particle density. So, that is you let us say you take a particle in you settle it in a water. So, what is the free settling velocity of that irregular particle that you measure? Then you take a different size of uh, spherical particles, you drop them in the, the same conditions and then you measure the settling velocity of each and uh, each spherical particles. Different spherical particles you have to do uh, with a kind of uh, one after other one. Right? So, whichever the spherical particle having the same settling velocity as the settling velocity of the irregular particle, then the size of that spherical particle would be taken as a kind of free falling diameter, equivalent free falling diameter. If the free falling speed is under the Stokes law rhythm, small Reynolds number rhythm, then the Stoke, that should be called as a Stokes diameter. Likewise, we have the sieve diameter, we take a kind of uh, sieve where the square apertures are there. So, whatever the passing through material is there, we take that uh, same square aperture as the kind of size of that particle. So, this anyway we are going to do in the size analysis, uh, screen analysis in the later course. So, this is how one can represent the equivalent sphere diameters. Equivalent sphere volume diameter, this is equivalent sphere volume diameter, this is equivalent sphere surface diameter, this is equivalent sphere surface volume ratio diameter like that all other diameters. right? So, but which one is reliable? 
That we cannot say, we are going to discuss that anyway. It is going to be different from one application to the other applications, we cannot generalize them. Likewise, equivalent circle diameter also defined the diameter of a circle which would have the same property of the projected outline of the particle. Let us say projected area diameter, if the projected area of the particle is resting in a stable position, then projected area diameter on the other hand, if the particle is randomly oriented, then perimeter diameter that is the perimeter of the outline of the circle that we have taken. So, like that equivalent circle diameters are also possible. All these things we are doing for a single particle. So, single particles, so the best one is that you know statistical diameter because obtained these things are the obtained when a linear dimension is measured usually by microscopic parallel to a fixed direction. You uh, orientation you fix and then for that fixed direction you measure the uh, linear dimension of that particle using the microscopy. So, this is going to be very much reliable fine very good, but this is valid only for single particles because in real life applications you have a large number of particles. You cannot keep on measuring the size and shape of each and every irregular particle using the microscopy. In real life applications we are going to have huge number of particles. So, under those conditions it is not possible to find out this size of each and every particle, though it is very much reliable. It is good as long as you know you are handling a single particle kind of thing. So, under statistical diameter also there are uh, different uh, linear dimensions are possible because we are measuring parallel to a fixed direction. So, different linear dimensions are possible for a given irregular particle. So, one is the Farad's diameter that is the distance between two tangents on opposite sides of the particle, then Martin's diameter, length of the line which bisects the image of the particle, then shear diameter, particle width obtained with an image shearing eyepiece, then maximum chord diameter, maximum length of a line limited by the contour of the particle. Now, having seen these many equivalent representations, how to make a selection of diameter of a regular particle, which equivalent diameter should we use? That is again big question, we cannot generalize in any way. Out of the aforementioned uh, diameter, most relative measurements would probably statistical diameters because they are directly determined by the microscopy. This is good for single particles, only few particles, but not laborious, we cannot uh, do for huge number of particles are involved in the process. However, for a, any given particle, Martin's and Farad's diameter, whatever the statistical diameters that you find, whether the Martin's diameter or Farad's diameter, they in general can be very much different from each other. After all, they are linear dimensions of a given particles. They change from the fixed position. You are keeping one fixed position, you get some values. When you change the fixed position, location, uh, direction you change, then you may get the different uh, uh, dimensions even because they are linear dimensions with parallel to fixed direction, right. So, Martin's and Farad's diameter could be radically different from each other that we are going to show pictorially anyway. Also, they are different from a circle of equal perimeter or equal area, so that also we can see. But in practice, most of the equivalent diameters will be measured indirectly to, a, to given a number of particles taken from a samples. Equivalent diameters will be measured indirectly, actually we do not measure each and every particle diameter like that. So, that we are going to see here this particular thing in a kind of screen analysis. Therefore, it would be most practical to use a quick, maybe less accurate, but quick on large number of particles than a very accurate measure on a very few particles. Though the statistical measurements are very accurate, it is not a good practice to depend on the statistical measurements, especially when large number of particles are involved. So, when large number of particles are involved, so it is obviously better that uh, you may have a slightly less accurate, but you wanted to have a kind of quick measurements. Those things that is what we are going to do in screen analysis. Now, why I said that you know uh, making a selection is very much difficult because here now this particle, this is the particle shape outli I am outlining here again, right. So, here this is the maximum linear uh, dimension and then this is the uh, minimum linear dimension, minimum linear 
dimension and then here this is maximum linear dimension and uh, this particular thing whatever this dimension is given this is nothing but Farad's dimension and then whatever this one this that is the bisecting the material this dimension is there that is Martin's dimension. So now you can see uh, by statistically whatever the sizes that you measure so now you can see the Farad's dimension is very much large compared to the Martin's dimension. So that is the reason it is a kind of very difficult to select which dimension should be taken or otherwise other example we take other kind of particles if your irregular particle is having a shape something like this after crushing the bulk material you get several particle one of the particle is having this kind of shape with a kind of hollow uh, hole here like this. Now this irregular particle if you are going to uh, define a diameter, diameter of a sphere of equal volume then you may get the size of this one. Then you define diameter of a sphere of uh, equal surface then you get that is you measure the surface of this particle and then you find out a spherical particle whose surface is same as the surface of this particular then you get a bigger size uh, like this. Likewise, you find out the drag offered by this uh, fluid in a flowing stream, fluid stream at a given velocity. So that drag in that flowing stream at the same velocity you take uh, spherical particles of different sizes and then find out which particle is offering the same drag as this irregular particle and then size of that spherical particle uh, offering the same drag is like this. Now you can see see all three equivalents are giving three different size indeed very different from each other not even close to each other. So this is the just a comparison just to have a kind of difficulty of uh, having which you know making a selection which equivalent size should be taken. So because of these things the selection should be based on the experience and an application of the process that is involved. So when different physical principles are used in the particle size determination that is, that is equal volume, equal surface, equal drag etc. these different properties when you use principles you use to find out the characteristic size then you may get different sizes as I just shown in a previous slide we get a different uh, sizes we, do, we may not get a kind of uh, identical results anyway. Therefore it is recommended to select a characteristic particle size according to the property or process which is under the study. For example, if we have a pneumatic conveying or gas cleaning system it is more relevant to use Stokes diameter in general because the particles in this kind of uh, pneumatic conveying systems or gas cleaning systems or uh, particle sizes are very very small in general in microns. right? So the settling velocity of those particles in general would be very small and then they fall under the Stokes region. So that is the region under those conditions Stokes diameter is very much reliable. If you take another example in the flow through packed or fluid as beds it is surface volume diameter which is more relevant to the hydrodynamic processes. Indeed we are going to derive this uh, kuzni karman equation for packed beds etc. So there we are going to use this surface volume uh, equivalent diameter right diameter of sphere which is having equal surface volume ratio as of the particle that is what we are going to in that in such kind of packed and fluid as bed it is better to use surface volume equivalent diameter. So having listing so many characteristic sizes uh, the different ways of representing the characteristic size of these particles you get the different uh, results for the same particles as I shown one in regular particles the volume equivalent diameter, surface equivalent diameter, drag equivalent diameter of a sphere are all three of them are having different sizes. So it is better to decide which characteristic size should be used based on the application as well as the experience of the process, um, person involved in that particular process. So we do some calculations sphere volume equivalent diameter calculation that is the diameter of sphere of equal volume as the particle that is what we are going to see. Now let us say if the particle shape is spherical 
then volume of the particle is pi d cube by 6. So, equivalent uh, nominal diameter dp we are going to find out. We are going to find out for different cases the equivalent or nominal diameter dp which is the diameter of sphere of equal volume. That is we are equating the volume of the particle to the volume of a spherical particle whose size is dp and then that dp is a kind of equivalent diameter or characteristic size of that uh, particle. right? So, now here pi d cube by 6 should be equals to pi d p cube by 6 though that means dp is equals to d. So, since both the reference material as well as the real particle both are in the spherical shape, so then dp should be equals to the d diameter of the particle of that sphere. Let us say if you have a short cylinders where the diameter is equals to the length of the cylinder or height of the cylinder, then we have the volume of the particle that short cylinder uh, cylindrical particles is pi r square l that we can write is because now here we are taking l is equals to d, so pi d cube by 4. Now, this pi d cube by 4 if you equate to the volume of a particle of uh, uh, spherical particle of size dp that is pi dp cube by 6, then we can get dp is equals to 3 by 2 power 1 by 3 d. That is short cylinders of L is equals to d where we take a short cylinders where the size is L is equals to the diameter of the particle. Then equivalent or nominal diameter dp is nothing but cube root of 3 by 2 times the diameter of the short cylinder. That is what we get. Likewise, short cubes if you take L is equals to d, then d cube should be the volume of the particle. So, d cube when you equate it to the pi d cube by 6, then you get nominal diameter dp is equals to 1.241 times d size of the cube. So, likewise for hemispherical particle, the volume of particle is pi d cube by 12. If this pi d cube by 12, if you equate to pi dp cube by 6, then dp you will get it as 0.7937d. Likewise, tetrahedron of size s, the volume of the tetrahedron is in general square root of 2 divided by 12 s cube and then that if you equate to the pi d cube, pi dp cube by 6, then you will get dp as 0.6083 s. Other examples like octahedron etc. also we can do similarly. Similarly, if you have a rectangular prism of size a by b by c, then volume is a by b by c and now if b is equals to a and c is equals to 2 times a, then volume will become 2 a cube. So, we have to have a kind of spherical particle whose volume is same as 2 a cube. So, spherical particle uh, volume is pi dp cube by 6 if that is equals to 2a cube, whatever the dp is there, that is nominal diameter, you will get 1.56311a. A is the size of the one side of the size of that prism, whatever we have taken. Likewise, if you take rashing rings, rashing rings as in general, you know, we have a kind of a, a smaller a cylindrical shape, hollow shape like this, hollow cylindrical shape something like this. So, uh, whose diameter is having you know inner diameter d i, outer diameter uh, d o right and then length is in general l right. So, if l is equals to d naught and d i is equals to half of d naught then volume of the whatever the rashing ring is there that should be pi d naught square l by 4 minus pi d i square l by 4. Now, you substitute l is equals to d naught and d i is equals to 0 0.5 d naught, you will get this one as 0 0.1875 pi d naught cube. So, nominal diameter pi d p cube by 6 is equals to 0 0.1875 pi d naught cube, where you get nominal size d p as 1.04 d naught. That is, nominal size of rashing ring is approximately same as the outer diameter of the rashing ring provided L is equals to d naught and di is uh, d naught by 2. Likewise, for any given individual particle, you can measure the nominal size. These are the diameter of sphere of equal volumes. Similarly, you can also do 
diameter of sphere of equal surface to volume ratio like that you can do for any uh, individual particles. But all these things we have done for single particle only. So the material provided here have been taken from these reference books, McCabe and Smith, Ortega Rivas, Richardson Harker, Carlson and Richardson uh, Chemical Engineering Series, second volume, John Copley's Transfer Process and Unit Operations, Brown et al. Unit Operations, Introduction to Chemical Engineering, Badger and Benchero. Most of the data you can find out from these first two books. Whatever the information provided in this particular lecture, most of the information is available in these first two reference books. Thank you.